so today I was going to talk about some of the measurements. Some mo most of them will be long-term uh, network-based measurements of atmospheric composition and some of the 2016 field activities going on that have an Arctic component to them. So the next slide shows my outline, and it so. The, uh, because it's NASA, I'm going to tell you about uh, the, the satellites that are currently up and sort of preview some of the satellites that are in, in formulation right now, and then show the monitoring networks that have Arctic components to them that support those satellite measurements and also support the RNA activities, the research and analysis uh, related to atmospheric composition, and then um, a couple of the airborne missions that will happen in 2016 that uh, will be making some measurements in the Arctic and then highlight some of the future opportunities for Arctic uh, campaigns. So the next slide is uh, a very busy slide that shows on the lower right the sort of the legacy satellites. These are in their extended operations and it goes back to Terra and Aqua. Uh, several instruments on atmospheric composition, especially aqua, but also uh, an aura. But Calypso is the LIDAR that's getting aerosol uh, profiles. And because these are in all of those satellites are in low Earth orbit, they're getting many passes uh, through the Arctic each day. And then the uh, left hand, lower left hand, shows the new satellites that are in their their prime mission right now, and uh, I think the most relevant is going to be the OCO2, getting CO2 measurements. I'll show you a slide later on of some of the CO2 data from OCO2, and it's uh, currently not reporting any of the, of the high Arctic data, but it, it will be available in the near future, hopefully. And then, um, on the upper right, you'll see the satellites that are going to be launched in the near future, and they're in orange. And then the yellow ones are ones that are being built. And um, the, uh, the the ones of most interest uh, to the Arctic, ISAT is going to be looking at the thickness of the ice sheets. Uh, and this OMPS is going to give us the ozone measurements. and then. Tempo is going to be primarily covering uh, North America. It, it, it won't get all the way up into the higher Arctic, Arctic but that will be in a geostationary orbit. And it's going to be looking at ozone, NO2, formaldehyde, SO2. And then uh, PACE is uh, not uh, – is, is going to be – is not currently under construction. Tempo is about one year out from being completely built. But uh, PACE is a, a polarimeter for aerosols and also an ocean color instrument. Uh, that'll be in a low Earth orbit, and that will um, – I can't remember the launch date on that offhand. But a lot of what we do is supporting these uh, global measurements that have a strong Arctic component. So the next slide. I'm going to um, just ask everybody to mute themselves because we're getting some um, background noise. If everybody could just check that they're on mute, please. Thank you. So you can advance it so that all the stuff on the slide is there. But uh, one of the longest long-term uh, – yeah, just to go back, there we go. One of the long-term NASA ground sites, and this is managed by Ken Junks in the – and this is the A-gauge network of ground-based uh, trace gas measurements, hydrocarbon measurements from uh, networks of gas chromatographs. And the NASA-funded ones are in red, but uh, we have the European collaborators that are helping out with uh, the, the Nee Allison site. Um, the next slide shows NDAC. <laughs> NDAC is the network for the detection of atmospheric composition change. 
And I will highlight some of these uh, networks. We'll look at Aeronet. We'll look at the MPL, MPLNet, the Micropulse LiDAR network, um, and TCON. So let's go. I will NDAC also is a network of uh, ground-based FTIR instruments. And uh, I think the next slide will show, yeah, so these are for all the different um, NDAC-affiliated networks, but um, you can see quite a few sites that are in the Arctic. And one of the uh, goals for NASA over the next five to 10 years is to increase the number of sites for these networks. And I'll talk about that when I get to the individual networks. So the, the next slide. Um, TCON is measuring total carbon columns. So this is to support OCO, but also it gets other trace gases. And specifically, methane is another trace gas. Let's look at the math is the next slide of TCON. So you can see there's uh, a high Canadian Arctic site and another one uh, that looks like Iceland to me. Um, and there's another one in Europe, Northern Europe again. Um, the uh, high altitude. I think it looks like it's in Svalbard Islands. Yes, right. I think I think you're right. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not Iceland is below that. You can see that small white. That little one's Iceland. No, right. The right, yeah, there. That's Iceland. Okay. So you, the Svalbard on top. Yeah, that's much it. farther, much farther north. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. The uh, so. Um, it's, it's a much longer uh, path through the atmosphere in the Arctic, as you guys are aware. Uh, so these, these high altitude uh, TCON sites are going to be really critical for NASA to get the CO2 retrieval from, um, from the Arctic. But they're, they're, uh, the, the instrument's performing really well. We have over a, a year of data right now. Um, why don't we go to the next slide? We'll look at the next network which is Aeronet. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Aeronet. It's a sun photometer. It's got a filter wheel, approximately 14 channels, um, over 600 sites. Uh, now it's completely automated. Um, the next uh, slide will show a better view of the network. Um, we are trying to fill in some of the holes that we have in Africa in this network, and we'd like to co-locate um, Aeronet with other resources on the ground, so maybe some of the, some of you from other agencies might be interested in hosting an Aeronet site. Um, the next network after this, the next slide will should show the the Micropulse LiDAR network, and this is a, a fairly inexpensive LiDAR to measure aerosol backscatter. We also retrieve boundary layer height from this, and uh, there's a, approximately 20 active sites right now. And th some of them have been moving around, but we'd like to grow the, the MPL net network. Uh, the next slide will show the map of, and in green you see the active sites, and they're mostly uh, in the Northern Hemisphere and uh, only one in the Arctic. But again, um, we are, uh, these, these are almost 100% co-located with Aeronet sites right now. Um, we'd like to get a uh, boundary layer height, turns out to be a very critical parameter for our retrievals and so from satellites. So we would like to expand this network again. Um, the next slide will show um, a new instrument the Pandora is a sun photometer going to a spectrometer. It's right now it's a UV vis spectrometer, and from this we retrieve ozone, SO2, formaldehyde, BRO, NO2, uh, water vapor. W what you see in this um, picture is two of them: one looking at the sun, getting the direct beam; the other one's looking at off-axis or uh, shifts to scanning the sky in off axis and acts as a max DOAS so we can try to retrieve the, the vertical column, vertical profile 
of uh, those trace gases. And there's about 20 uh, Pandoras uh, currently deployed. The next slide has a listing of them uh, with not all the dots. The dots in Europe haven't been filled in yet, but we, we have uh, – this needs to be updated. We, we now have nine of them in Korea for our upcoming Corus AQ field campaign. Uh, but we, again, uh, we have a couple that are uh, in the Arctic right now. We'd like to expand uh, the Pandora network. Uh, the, the Europeans are investing. They just ordered about 20, uh, the, the European Space Agency. So this network is going to grow dramatically over the next several years. Uh, and in order to help uh, validate the Tempo satellite, we will be growing the Pandora network in the U.S. as well. But uh, we'd love to see more of these in, in the Arctic. And uh, it, it does a good job at retrieving ozone like a brewer. It's, uh, it's an automated instrument. Um, and I'd be ha uh, there's a a prototype version that also has a second spectrometer, a, a near-infrared spectrometer attached to it, so it's getting aerosol optical depth in, in the infrared and in the visible wavelengths. So uh, this has potential to be a future replacement for Aeronet, although that's still quite a few years off. The next slide. All right, so we're switching from the monitoring networks to the Airborne Campaigns, and this is a new Earth Venture suborbital campaign, ATOM, the Atmospheric Tomography uh, Mission. This is uh, PI-led. Steve Wapsey of Harvard University is uh, led a team of that's going to take the NASA DC-8. The first flight is going to be out of Palmdale, California, and fly north um, and do this porpoising maneuver when it goes from uh, – the 1,000 feet above the surface up to something like 30 or 40,000 feet. And uh, there's, there's several NASA, NOAA, and university folks on, the, uh, on board measuring a whole suite of trace gases and aerosol and uh, remote sensing uh, quantities. Uh, so it's a full atmospheric composition payload. And they're going to land in Anchorage and then go south through the Pacific Ocean and then switch over, uh, fly over Antarctica, and switch over to Punta Arenas, and then go up the Atlantic. And then it's going to land in, um, after the Azores, it'll go up to Thule. Uh, and it's also going to, the first deployment, it actually is going to land in Kangaroo-Sac, but it's going to do, um, fly north out of Thule and do a profile um, over, I'm trying to remember the name of that, oh, there it is, uh, those, those, Cyan dots are um, TCON sites, and I can't remember which TCON site that is. Thanks. But um, so this is going to – the next slide will show there's going to be four deployments. Of, so the first is this summer starting June 21st. Um, so that's the late summer deployment. And then there's a winter deployment uh, this winter in January, a fall deployment in 2017, September 2017, and then a spring deployment in 2018. So uh, this will be getting some, some very interesting nearly pole-to-pole -pole sampling of the um, vertical profiles of the atmosphere. The next slide shows the above campaign, and this is the Arctic Boreal Vulnerability, vulnerability Experiment. This is primarily looking at terrestrial ecosystems. Um, this project started last year uh, with ground site measurements. Uh, ground-based measurements, but it's going to have an airborne component this summer. And the reason I'm highlighting it is because it's, a, it's an eight- to ten-year commitment from NASA to study the Arctic, uh, Arctic ecosystems and the, the greenhouse gases uh, uptake and release. And I think it's an opportunity for uh, the atmospheric composition community to leverage this long-term effort to get additional trace gas measurements help us uh, expand those networks for Pandora and for MPLNet and um, Aeronet uh, to some of these above sites that are long-term uh, commitment from NASA at this point. 
The next slide will show um, a new instrument. Richard Ekman is the project's program scientist for this instrument. It's uh, the EPIC camera. It's a million miles out from Earth at the L1, Lagrangian point one. And so I was a little bit skeptical that we would see these plots, but um, last week I got emailed this plot of total ozone, and it's see it's in a in this orbit. It's always seeing the sunlit part of the Earth, and so every day um, we get about uh, 12 hourly images from this sensor. And if if we can get a couple more ground sites, we might be able to get even more images. But it. Uh, as you all know, in the summertime, we'll be able to see the full Arctic uh, from this vantage point, get hourly data. And right now they're retrieving ozone, but there's possibility to get some other. It's a UV vis um, sensor. And so maybe if there's questions, Richard might be able to help, help me answer about what. But this is data that will be available soon. And we have uh, probably six months of data. And so. They're still working on uh, the retrieval, but once we get it, we'll be able to go back in time and get. Um, so uh, this is another uh, sensor that will be quite interesting, a, a unique f uh, viewpoint that we haven't seen of the sunlit portion of the Arctic to get uh, such high temporal resolution from space. And the next slide is showing, this is just a brief summary of the CO2 data from space. And you can see we're starting to get up into the Arctic, uh, but once they improve the retrieval algorithm, we should be able to get uh, the whole Arctic region covered. And uh, Ken Jux is the program scientist for this. I'll, but I'd be happy to keep the IARCPIC community uh, to alert them when the, the full data set is available. And then the next slide is just a reminder that this is from the ARCTAS mission that we have done uh, atmospheric composition, atmospheric chemistry focused projects on biomass burning and, and Arctic in the past, uh, and that we should start thinking about how we can do this in the future. Uh, um, I know that Hal Mehring is busy in 2018 doing a tropical mission, but after that, I think there's an opportunity for him, myself, or Ken Jux to think about a future airborne campaign uh, in the Arctic. Do you have any questions? Thanks, Barry. That was a really nice overview. I learned a few things from that. And this is Allison. Um, I'll start off with a couple of questions. First, about the ground based networks. Um, you mentioned that uh, NPL Net has 20 active sites and is, is wanting to grow. What's involved in hosting one of these sites? Does it work similarly to Aeronet, where uh, do we purchase an instrument? And That's exactly right. If you purchase an instrument, you can join the network. And uh, it, it's got a very nice automated retrieval algorithm. Um, the, the, the data we do, we, we pretty much do all the rest of the work except need a site operator. But they're fairly uh, low maintenance instruments. We're even trying to extend MPL Net to less, much less expensive uh, ceilometers. And oh, so, great. yeah, I think that's pretty much ready to go. Uh, maybe in a future IRC, I can get Judd Welton to MPL Net. Uh, Principal investigator to talk about the possibilities for for joining the MPL Net group and uh, but yeah I, I'm very excited about the the use of heliometers as well for for PBL. It's not going to get to calibrated backscatter, but it will be if, if all you're interested in is layer detection and PBL uh, identification, then it's quite good. yeah it's good information for um, a lot less input up front. Correct. I also had a question about the Aeronet um, network. And in that, uh, the new Simul Sun photometers are also serving as lunar photometers these days. And 
I was wondering if there was any um, planned effort to replace existing instruments in the Arctic with those that have the uh, lunar capabilities. That or is a that great a that is a great idea. Um, the the, uh, the Pandora also is working quite well using the moon as a light source, reflected sunlight off the moon. Um, and I would email Brent Holbin, the, the Aeronet. Uh, it might just be a matter of programming, uh, changing the programming for uh, to, to be able to get lunar retrievals. Uh, but be, you're welcome to CC me on this, and so I can follow up uh, with more information uh, if if needed for uh, yeah if you know of an operator in the Arctic that wants to uh, to get Aeronet retrievals off the, uh, off the 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 moon that would be uh, great to know about. Okay, maybe we'll talk about that at a future meeting. Sure. We have questions from anyone else? Um, hi, it's Michal. Just a side note. I think on the same on the same line as yours. So, some of the new Aeronet instruments also have um, pol polarized channels, which can enhance um, retrievals or produce new retrievals of clouds and and aerosol properties. So this might be another item to think of when when replacing or adding capabilities to the Arctic. Um, we're currently at Ames, we have a polarized channel Aeronet, and we are starting to work on, on improving the cloud retrieval capabilities and maybe even um, improving aerosols using the polarized channel. Great, thanks. Questions from anyone else? All right, again, thanks, Barry. My pleasure.